so welcome everyone the ones that are here i know you're you're joining in various at various times uh, so glad you could join us for today's spotlight on finance, the panel discussion. My name is Tricia Grace and I'm with the alumni office. Feel free to add questions in the chat and I will see them for our question period, which will begin around uh, 1240 and we will have about 10 minutes to go through the questions. Before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. So George Brown College is located on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and other Indigenous peoples that have lived here over time. We are grateful to share this land as treaty people who learn, work, and live in the community with each other. So our panelists today are Faith Pember, student recruiter with Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario, David Anning, Senior Team Lead at TD Bank and graduate of George Brown College, yay. And Judy Choi, Talent Act Attraction Specialist at KPMG Canada and also one of our awesome graduates. Welcome and great to have you with us today. It's great to be here. Yeah, to yeah. Be here. yeah thank you for having us. Yeah, it's going to be good. I'm so glad you took the time to come and chat with us. I know the that graduates are always so grateful for any information they can get from graduates, HR, anyone out there who can give them insights into how to launch their career. So thanks for that. So let's take a closer look at all things financial. And I'm going to start with Faith. Faith, can you tell us a bit more about the role of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario and your main role? Uh, and basically, how do they support students and graduates looking to develop their skills and subsequently their hiring potential? Excellent. So good question. So CPA Ontario, we are a provincial regulatory body. So there's kind of the umbrella of CPA Canada that oversees. So as a regulatory body, we protect the integrity of the profession and we also promote it uh, within the uh, the within the province. So CPA Ontario obviously looks at after, uh, after all of the CPAs in Ontario. So we basically communicate with them, make sure that they are professionally developing because one of the biggest parts of having your CPA is continuous professional development. Uh, we oversee um, any disciplinary actions and there's lots of different moving wheels and uh, my department is with students and people coming into the profession. So I am a student recruiter. Uh, so it's, it's almost a bit of a misnomer like uh, what my title is because I don't hire people to work at CP Ontario, but I recruit into the profession. So a lot of my work centers around educating about the different pathways to the CPA designation, whether that be in front of audiences, uh, on panels like this, doing information sessions or one-on-one -on -one advisements with students. I manage a lot of relationships between post-secondary institutions, George Brown being one of them, and CPA Ontario. So being that kind of point of contact, uh, that go-to person for questions, because sometimes, you know, having that generic email, you just, you just want a person and know that there's a person behind the email. So I will be definitely putting my email in the chat if you ever want to connect with me and connect with me on LinkedIn. And a huge part of my work is actually developing student skills through something called the Post-Secondary Ambassador Program or PSAP. So if you've ever seen me speak or do any speeches, uh, I've definitely talked about PSAP because I think it's a really unique program. So we focus on inspiring, developing and connecting students with CPAs. So we want to connect you through uh, things like the CP Ontario Cafe, where you can network. Networking is a huge part of my work and I really love connecting students with CPAs to explore their options because it's such a broad designation, like you find CPAs everywhere in every single industry. So it's a really, really important designation too. And developing student uh, talent too, that's a huge passion of mine. Mentoring is a huge passion. So I love developing us uh, uh, human skills. So we're trying to move away from soft skills because it almost makes it sound not important important but being in the recruiting world that's that's what gets you the job and I'm sure we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, and uh, technical skill workshops too with different emerging technologies like uh, data analytics which I'll go into a little bit later uh, but it's uh, I wear many different hats but a lot of it is uh, doing events like this and just speaking with the public speaking with students and advising so if you ever have questions I'm your go-to person and uh, yeah, I, I hope that that explains it too. I'm sure we have a, we launched a new website, so we have more language there about what it is CP Ontario, but we oversee and make sure uh, there's still the integrity of the CPA profession. 
Well, I think that um, that's great information. And I know that the college has an ongoing relationship with CPA Ontario. Um, and so it's wonderful that graduates who maybe weren't, didn't take advantage of the beginning when they were students, perhaps, and connecting with those and, and learning more about CPA that will learn, little, they'll, they'll learn a little more today about it. So thanks, Faith. I'm going to stay with you actually for a second because I wanted to get from your perspective, because you're immersed in the financial sector, you go out to speak, so you must have a lot of information about what's going on out there. Um, I know specifically for the accounting profession, but could you share with us sort of the overall health of the financial sector as we come out of COVID-19 or we go back, we go back and forth, but I think we are definitely the economies coming out of COVID-19. Where is there stability, growth and decline in the financial services? So this is quite a beefy question, but uh, I think we're quite lucky in Canada. There, there is a lot of stability inherent in our systems and regulatory oversight in Canada as well. So we were quite lucky. Bouncing back um, quite quickly, I would say, there's different sectors that are affected slightly differently. Um, I think the biggest change that, and this is definitely like in my sphere, is the relationship between candidates and employers, because this this kind of immediate or like really quick shift and pivot to working from home uh, has really changed the relationship. So a lot of my work is trying to get people into the same room and talk to each other. So a lot of the the um, kind of difficulty in that is renting space, which costs money, you know, trying to geographically connect a lot of people too, because Toronto is such a hub, it's it's hard to engage. So we, we try to engage with the entire province. So this shift to online platforms, I think that we've seen a huge growth and it's really switched into the candidate's favor uh, for the market too. It's interesting talking to uh, different firms because we're always talking about different hiring practices, what are trends are you seeing? And it's the, the questions that kind of, um, I, I don't know if pushback is the, the correct word, but uh, the questions that students are asking in interviews and in networking and stability is actually a really important word too, because this is what I've seen come up in a lot of my events and as a lot of my talking with students too, is like, you know, the stability of the profession, do I want to go into this? Um, and my answer is always yes, because of the versatility of having a CPA as well. But I think the biggest growth factor has just been the connections that people have been able to make because it kind of evens the playing field a little bit. There's a lot of CPAs across Canada that have actually connected with and have come out to our events or people that are up north that it would be like quite a trek to come into the city. But now it's really, really easy to jump on like an online platform. And it's been interesting seeing the different um like firms and industry and different companies how they connect with students as well so i think we were pretty quick off the mark with doing the uh the zoom technology and i still shake my head because i'm just like skype had forever to prepare for this pandemic and yet zoom and webex and all these different technologies still came out ahead um but it's been really interesting seeing all the companies really uh, like KPMG and TD Bank too, hosting their own webinars and open houses and trying to engage with students as well. And having everyone, kind of be, I hope everyone here is uh, very proud of themselves too. Everyone's become a public speaker because that's essentially what all of these online platforms have become because only one person can really speak at a time. So I, I think it's been a really quick shift in a lot of uh, human skills that a lot of people have developed. Absolutely, we've all had to pivot. And I think, you know, in some ways it has allowed for a lot more accessibility and that has been a really positive thing that's come out. So depending on where you live or your ability to, to move, you know, all those things that um, can sometimes affect whether you're gonna attend something. So, so Judy, I was wondering as a talent recruiter for college and university campuses, what was the impact of COVID? Uh, what, what was the impact on the recruitment efforts or practices of KPMG? Yeah, so I completely agree with what you said, Faith. Like the whole virtual, I mean, first of all, I can't believe it's been almost been two years with this pandemic. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that um, for us as well was definitely the shift to uh, the fully remote work environment, like virtual interactions, not only changed like the process of our recruitment, but also it became the only available method because we were all virtual. Um, so instead of you know doing everything in person, we're doing onboarding on virtually. We're hosting those info sessions virtually, networking sessions virtually. So, I think a big part of my role is actually being on campus and meeting and building relationships with students. Like what you said, Faith. Like, I think that also changed when we went fully remote. So, um, I mean, it, it's just 
there are some good parts about virtual events like the accessibility part and all that but there, there's not the missing part of in-person events for sure um and i think everyone here can relate as well because virtual classes are not the same as in-person classes right it's just it's a whole different thing um, but I do believe it has some positive impacts, like hybrid workforce on site and remote is more normalized now, and uh, like hiring process that combines virtual and in person processes, like it's becoming more standard now. When as we are coming out of COVID, uh, for example, I see virtual interviews becoming like more of a standard thing now. It's not like a big option. I believe a lot of companies are gonna adapt that and go forward with that. And we're looking, we're really looking to leverage this virtual and in-person recruitment combination. And I, I, I did see that it increased efficiency with working virtually as well. So it does have some positive impacts on recruitment, but we also, um, we also see in, in the trends that, you know, reality is a virtual fatigue, right? We want to be mindful of that and something we may do in New Year's, we remain virtual for like big info sessions that we might host to reach the greater population. But for those that we're hosting for building personal connections, we might do that in person. So I think we're very hopeful in bringing back in person, at least a hybrid form of events, but uh, it's definitely like a weird time as we are kind of transitioning out of COVID, but kind of still in it. So yeah, like I think it has some good and bad parts uh, to recruitment processes. Well, I agree. The hybrid version would probably be the preferred version so that it's, it, it, it can be uh, open to those who, who prefer one or the other. So that, that is great. Um, David, I wanted to ask you, so you graduated from human resources at George Brown College. How did you end up pivoting into a senior team lead position at TD? Um, so just like a bit about my background. So yes, I went to George Brown for human resources and business admin. And just upon graduating, like any other student, you kind of feel like you're going to get your dream job, the job that you're working for you get. But with me, um, getting the job at TD kind of fell in my lap through networking. I just knew some friends that worked for the organization and I kind of just shot my shot and I was like, hey, get me a job at TD. And it was like, okay, send me your resume. And I didn't act on it right away. I kind of was like, okay, whatever, because I've heard that conversation before. Then my friend reached back out to me and was like, hey, send me your resume. Let me get let me get you into an interview. And I did that. And funny story behind it is when I actually applied for my job at TD, I didn't start off as a team lead. I kind of started at the bottom. I started in the branch um, working as a teller and kind of worked my way up. So funny story behind it is when I did my initial interview for TD, my interview was actually with a friend that I went to middle school with, and I didn't see, I haven't seen this person for many years, probably over 10 years. And when we sat down in the interview, we went through the interview process and we just kind of broke the ice and was like, hey, what school did you go to? Where did you grow up? And just come to find out that we went to middle school together, we were in the same classes. And it just goes to show, it goes along with a show that you never know who you, you never know who you're gonna need down the road in life in line. So just always treat people accordingly, treat them with respect and keep those contacts around because it comes back tenfold down the line in life. Like for me, if I had a bad rapport with the person I was interviewing with, there was there, there'll be a good chance that I did not get the job, but it worked out in my favor. So just always keep good relationships and yeah, that's how I ended up in TD, just by referral, by a friend networking, and I'm here today. That is such a cool story. And again, you're right. It just tells you about every everybody down the road you could meet again. And it's about branding, right? So how have you branded yourself? How will you be remembered when someone runs into you? What do they think of you? You start your branding early on and uh, really important to be conscious of, of that because networking is so vital to moving yourself into your career and through your career. So great, great information. Thanks, David. Um, I have a question for Faith um, around networking because you're in, because you too have had a, a, an interesting uh, movement within your career. Did you use networking to make contacts within the industry to land your job with CPA? And oh. that's one part of my question. And what is your key piece of advice for grads trying to enter the financial industry? 
So always be networking. That's, that's my piece of advice. So I actually, I do a lot of workshops around networking. It's a huge topic that I'm always talking about. I'm a huge proponent of it. I had a very similar uh, story uh, to, to David actually. So I had returned from South Korea. I'd been overseas for a little bit and I was working at, living at home, working in my hometown. And I was like, okay, hey, I need to get to the city. Just applied for a temp job and I networked my way up uh, within the company. So I started off at a temp contract. I was in a small windowless room, taking staples out of paper, photocopying it and stapling it again for about four months. Uh-huh. But uh, what I did, and I think networking, we it conjures this very specific image of people in suits in a room, shaking hands and being like, oh yes, I'm interested in this position. Networking is just talking to people and just uh, like you said, branding yourself. Um, so what I did, so unknowingly, I didn't realize it, but I, when I was putting together a workshop, I realized, oh yeah, I actually networked my way into this role. So I just kept asking, how can I help you? Or, oh, I saw this, th- this process, would you like some help with this? So I jumped to a couple of contracts, ended up in the education department because I ha- had a, a strong educational background. And then it was actually, I became a subject matter expert in prerequisites uh, for entering the CPA program. And it was the recruitment team that actually approached me and said, hey, we need a subject matter expert to come and speak at this conference. Will you come and come and speak? And oh my gosh, so much, so much sweat and tears and like so much practice for the public speaking too. Went great because when this position came up, I actually had my director come over to me when she got, saw the email, did the company wide like position open. She's the VP now and she came over and said, hey Faith, I think you should apply for this. So unknowingly, it's, I want you to kind of put, and I don't say this to scare you, but you're always kind of auditioning and networking with people that you know, and being running in a lot of like networking circles, it's a very small world. Like uh, David bumping into his middle school friend, uh, the waitressing job that I got in my hometown when I came home, I walked in, it was a woman I went to high school with and she said, oh, I'm actually leaving in a month, hold on. And she asked the manager to come out and she's like, hey, I found my replacement. And it, five minutes later, I'm signing forms and they're like, okay, you start on Monday. So my biggest piece of advice is just showing up. It's the, the point is to really get your name in front of these people's faces. And there's a couple, there's two different quotes that I use a lot. If you ask for a job, you're going to get advice. But if you ask for advice, you might get a job. So I'm constantly asking people for advice. And I think that, that can really help you frame the conversation from the student perspective. Because I see a lot of students down talk themselves. Oh, what do I have to offer this person? It's speaking for, I hope I'm not speaking too boldly for, for you, Judy, but like a lot of our job is trying to get inside your head. So you asking for advice, sharing your insights, it's hugely valuable to our work. So asking for advice like, oh, okay, you know, you know, that typical question, what, what sort of advice would you give your younger self? Or I'm in this kind of conundrum, what's your kind of guidance about that? And the other quote that I constantly bring up is that Maya Angelou quote, where people will forget what you say, blah, 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 but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that's very true in networking is you're trying to, you're, or at least my brand too, is that you're trying, I'm trying to inspire a very specific feeling when I talk with people. I try to be approachable, be warm and welcoming and helpful. Like that's, that's the kind of vibe that I'm going for. So think to yourself, what do I want someone to walk away feeling after they talk to me? And also be bold, especially with uh, virtual networking. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is the place to be for this particular industry. Just reach out and say, hey, you know, I, I think you have a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, work uh, experience. Uh, do you have 15 minutes to chat? And I think because we're all fairly well versed with uh, different technology platforms, yeah, can I can we have a Zoom call for about 15 minutes? Ask a couple questions. And that, that re-engagement of a network, another huge piece of advice I tell students is post on LinkedIn. It doesn't have to be a blog. You do not need to write a novel of emotion. Just if you read an interesting article, post it. What did you learn from it? What, what were your thoughts on that? And tagging people. So I give you full permission, connect with me on LinkedIn and tag me and talk about your experiences at different events like this. This would be a perfect event to post on LinkedIn about. I went to this panel hosted by uh, this person, saw these panelists, you know, uh, Judy, thank you for making such a great point about this. David, I really appreciated your insight on this topic. That's how you can kind of engage with people. But yeah, I, I'm always game to talk about networking tips. And I think it's the most valuable tool, because especially in the recruitment world, a lot of jobs are just, they're filled just through referrals, like David said. 
it's, hey, I, I know someone that would be good for this position. Here's their resume. And I, it's interesting because I've heard uh, information interviews is like that secret weapon. I've heard it yes. referred to as that. And I thought it is because a lot of the times people don't fully understand what it is. Uh, information interviewing, Google it because it's a great uh, thing to know about. And then reaching out through places like LinkedIn to set those up. And it can make a huge difference in your career. Definitely. Um, okay, Jude, I wanted to ask you something because you, so you decided to, to study human resources at GBC and then uh, you found work at KPMG and you found work at KPMG in the middle of COVID when so many companies had slowed down or could completely stop recruiting efforts. Can you talk to us a bit about that and how that came about? Yeah, so like you mentioned, like I did the HRM uh, graduate certificate program at George Brown, and it was honestly an amazing experience to learn all the things about HR from actual industry, like uh, professors that had industry experience. Um, a little bit of background from me as well, like I, my undergrad was, undergrad was actually in science, so it's a completely different field from HR. I've always had an interest in student engagement and recruitment, so. Um, I was looking to different programs and I decided to go forward with the George Brown one because I had a co-op option at the end. And I think co-op and internship is like a great way to learn more about the field and gain transferable skills and building networks within your industry. I 100% agree with you, Faith. Like networking is the key to, you know, everything, uh, especially in the financial industry. So my co-op term was actually in at George Brown, I was in the center of business uh, field education office. So I was working with students um, in the in their co-op programs and I was helping them build their professional skill sets and coach them through their co-op search journey. So from then, like I instantly knew I was interested in this field and early talent acquisition. I wanted to work in campus recruiting and I was lucky enough to um, get here at KPMG. So I would say my piece of advice for how I got, I guess, this uh, job was I started my full-time role very early. So I was, I knew that with COVID, the job market was not going to be like normal. There's not going to be a lot of job opportunities that was um, open. So I started early. I also networked a lot. So I talked to a bunch of people. I, I re literally just reached out on LinkedIn. It's like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm interested in going to HR. Like you have a really interesting, you know, career. Can you talk to me about that? And I met a lot of people who connected me another, to another people and it kind of like leads on to that. Um, but yeah, I applied to the posting. So I was applying to the uh, coordinator role at KPMG and I saw the job description and I was like, this is what I want to do. This is my dream job. And I went for it. So I was, you know, I knew that when I was, you know, searching and when I was writing my application, I made sure that um, I was using the job description to tailor my application. I think that's the most important thing when you're, um, when you're submitting your application or you're preparing, make sure you're tailoring your application to the job that you're applying to. Like it might be difficult or time consuming um, to make like, you know, tailor the job skills and things that they require to your application, but it's actually very important because recruiters, like what, what I do now, we look at that and we kind of envision you in the role when you kind of set that up for us and we can kind of envision you in the role better. So I think that's how, I don't know how I got it, but that's I, I, like, I like to think that's how I got the role. And you know, it's, I think right now the, the job industry is slightly getting better. There's a huge demand for talent currently. And I think with the emerging hybrid work method, like more opportunities are opening because more people can work from home. So I think my piece of advice for those of you that are currently searching for jobs, like uh, be open minded to opportunities. You never know what you might like, what might you might end up with, but don't just go for your dream title because that might not be you know, what you think it is, or it might be even better than what you thought it was. So that's just how um, I got my role. That's really interesting. Th thanks, Judy. Um, and great tips for grads. And, you know, they need to hear that again and again. Um, and, and just to understand from a grad perspective what it takes, you know, what to think about how, when you're preparing to apply for opportunities. Now, um, David, for you, so you're working at TD, and I know a lot of graduates, they just, they, you know, they, a lot of them want to get into banks. And, the, the, you know, 
they tend to want the top five. You're in TD. What was the recruitment process like? Because I think that a lot of grads would like to know more about that recruitment process. So, yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, um, my process was, I guess, was kind of a bit easier because I was networking. I kind of got a referral to get in. But just for those that want to get into TD, just a little tip here. So even I was surprised myself when I first found this out. TD actually gets a million applications a year. Uh, yeah, so they get a million applications a year, which is a high number. I, I When I first heard that, I was like, wow, I was amazed. But with the way like the way um the world is now with technology just utilizing linkedin finding a position that you want and um reaching directly out to the recruiter so a lot of times now on linkedin you can see who the recruiter is who the hiring manager is um just direct message them um ask if they're still hiring ask if you could um if they could set aside some time for you to have a quick little 15 minute conversation about the position what they're looking for and just take them from there or if you know someone within an organization, see if they're able to refer you. Um, when applying online, just cater your, your resume to the job description. So add certain keywords into your resume that, that, that's gonna stick out and just have your resume stick out because like I said, with TD, there's a million people per year um, applying to the organization through different departments. So a lot of resumes could get overlooked. So just taking that, um, just taking that step, that extra step in just reaching out directly to recruiters, um, finding out if you have a friend that works there and just catering your resume to the job description. Yeah, uh, that's all great stuff. And you, I can't get over that number though, a million. A million. I mean, it's, it is a, a large number. Not that surprising. I know I hear that from other banks too, that they're just, there's ongoing recruitment. So they're they're constantly hearing from people and, but a million, wow. When okay. I, when I first heard the number, I had to ask again. I was like 1 million and they were like, yes, a million. Well, that must make you feel pretty special. Yeah. <laughs> you got in there. <laughs> in there. Yeah. Pretty lucky. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Faith, I see, I see in your LinkedIn profile that you took off a, a bit of time and traveled and that you said it was the best decision of your life. Um, how has that experience informed your career direction and how you work with people? Yeah, so if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you can see I've kind of bounced between a lot of stuff. So I feel like I haven't given a little bit of my background too. So I'm not a CPA. Uh, I do not have a business degree. I have a degree in classics, so ancient history and languages. <laughs> so it's always a bit of bit of a mystery. It's like, how did you end up here? And it's, networking is the is the answer, and just keeping myself open to those opportunities. But there's two big travel periods in my life. So. When I was uh, after my third year of university, I did an archaeology dig in the south of Italy for a month uh, for a course. And then I was like, hey, I'm in Europe, so I'm going to travel for a month. And then I originally planned to travel with a friend, but I just did it by myself for a month. That was my first big trip. Had a, a flex flexi pass to like be on the train system, which is fantastic in Europe. And I learned so much about myself within that trip. So, um, if you if you do have the resources or the time and the inclination, I really recommend that. You know, you don't have to do a month in Europe, but if you can do any form of solo travel, it is such a life changing experience because you only have one person to rely on yourself. And then the other big travel that I did was after I graduated university. I knew that I wanted really wanted to continue to travel. I wanted to work abroad because I thought that would be just really important just for life. So I ended up teaching English in South Korea for about two years in Busan. Uh, I was such a beautiful city. I can't wait to go back. Um, and then after my two years of teaching there, I had saved up enough money to travel for about three months around Asia. And then I did a bit of Europe again as well, a couple spots that I missed out on. I think the biggest growth opportunity too, especially from a lot of solo travel is that resiliency. Again, another buzzword that's like so overused in this pandemic, like resiliency, these are unprecedented times. I know that, you know, it's kind of a, a little, we need like a bingo card whenever we go to yeah. these events. It's like, <laughs> who says unprecedented times first? But um, I think it's building that resiliency, which is one of the most important skills that you could really have that adaptability. There, it really, what comes to mind when I uh, tell kind of different travel stories was like haggling my way onto a bus, uh, my biggest thing was actually that trip from Europe was I had completely messed up trying to get from the middle of Switzerland to Paris. And I was like, oh, there will be a train, whatever. I had to hop on like six different trains because there was no direct route. And I remember this 
very rude woman <laughs> was just like, yeah, it's not possible. You should go find a hotel in the city. Like you just can't do it. So I went outside, had a panic attack. And then I had this almost euphoric moment of being like, okay, well, it's just you here. No one's going to swoop in and like fix this. You have to fix this. You got to get this done. And I flash back to that moment too, when I'm in those high pressure situations, which is a lot of event management and like putting wheels together. We're doing a huge conference charter for success in January. So th there's always, there's just things you cannot prepare for. And in those high pressure situations, I think about that moment of crouching <laughs> on that train station floor and being like, okay, we got to make this work. So I went in and just asked like one last time, I'm going to talk to somebody else. Maybe it was a bit of a language barrier. Um, ended up finding a train and, and got my way there. But I think it's just proving to yourself too, because sometimes we have those moments of self-doubt was like, no, I can't do this. And then you almost have to have an example in your head. And, a, and another huge thing that I think has really helped shape my career is having that uh, intercultural empathy and being, being a foreigner in another country. Like I lived in a country for two years where I didn't speak the language. I was a visible minority, not, not that I have like any realm of experience with that too, because it was a lot of like preferential treatment uh, within Korea being white, but um, just not knowing the, the language and not knowing a lot of cultural customs too. I would like to think that that's really helped shape a lot of how I interact with people in my career and life as well, because it's, I know that kind of overwhelming feeling of being in an unfamiliar place and like not really knowing what to say, or just like, you, you know, somebody cracks a joke and you don't quite get it. And you're looking around going like, I just, I don't quite understand what's going on. So I think it's really helped sharpen that. I was already always been a very empathetic person, but it really helped sharpen that skill too. So that's why I love being in hosting those networking events because I do want to find those students that are nervous, don't know how to approach people. It's why I created that entire workshop and I talk about it so much is because I've been in those your shoes where it's my first networking event. I started this recruitment role with no recruitment experience at all, no networking experience. And my first networking event, I was paralyzed. I, what do I say to these people? I, I literally do not know what to say. My mind went blank. So I, I can really empathize with that position and how scary it can be so i think that's really helped shape my career is i've always been a helper and i think it's just really mm -hmm. helped tighten that into focus there as well but yeah if you have the time and resources for traveling i think just exposing yourself to different cultures different viewpoints and just being able to see how things are done differently and having an appreciation for that as well and the work culture in korea is very different from like the work culture in North America and it's really interesting comparing and contrasting and trying to take the good from all of the different work spheres that I've been in where it's like okay I really like this aspect I really like this aspect you know let's bring this in those sorts of things so I think yeah that's been really fundamental in a lot of my career growth well you know I couldn't agree with you more and um self-disclosure I too took off for a few years taught abroad did I did a lot of that and I the way you state it, Faith, it's so true. It's a way to build resilience. You learn that you are quite capable of managing really difficult situations. Uh, you're, you're able to adapt. So you have that, you learn the skill of adaptability um, and it opens up your, your, your view of the world and where people come from and how we are all one and we all think the same yeah. ways. And it's a, it was a great experience and you're, and you're right. Anybody who gets a chance to do that, um, I advocate for that too. It's a, it's a lifelong experience and you get lots of skills from it. So fantastic. Um, I want to ask Judy, what are the new and emerging technologies coming into play for human resources in the financial industry that you've observed? Yeah, thank you. So I think the new trend now is like digital digitalization and all like companies organizations and i think the one of the biggest ones that uh, we are seeing is automation in hr processes so within our ats system we're building rpas which are robotic process automations to increase efficiency in any um, recruitment process situation um so for example uh, one of the things that i'm work we're working on at kpmg we're working on implementing a bot that would actually automatically change candidate status on our ats so for example if a candidate ex uh, accepts our offer um you what we had to do before we had to manually move them and check if they accepted or declined and then manually 
connected them to a different status. But now this bot, if we launch it, it will automatically check that for us and then it will move them to uh, offer accepted status. And I think that itself saves a lot of time on recruiters and we can focus on other areas of our role. And uh, we also have uh, something called KPMG Ready. So it's our game-based assessment app um, and it's a really innovative approach to the recruitment process. It allows us to get to know the candidate on a deeper level beyond how they present on interviews or networking. So what it is like a series of games um, that the candidates will play. And then at the end, they'll receive like a personalized report on their work ethic, their personality or anything that relates to um, what the game assess. So I think that itself, um, I heard a lot of feedback from our candidates that that part they really enjoyed. It wasn't like a serious like interview thing. Like it, it was really like a fun interactive way to get to know them better as a person, as a candidate. And also it's really great for us and our interviewers to um, get to know the candidate better. So I'm sure there's so many other ones and technologies that um, are really emerging in HR, but those are some of the few that I can list on top of my head. So um, yeah, but I think technology is the new thing now. Um, everyone is involved in it and I think it's great. I think it uh, makes everything easier and well, we also need that human aspect and we cannot forget about that. But yeah, I think technology is gonna be um, everywhere. <laughs> it is already everywhere, but even more than now. It is, and I, you know, we 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 all know about the ATS uh, systems and and how they work, and 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 trying, you know, to get resumes up to be seen by a human eye. Um, and I think that there are some really interesting trends that are going on in HR, and hopefully, they're going to make it easier or more streamlined for grads to apply for opportunities, um, gamifying things. I mean, that that seems to be the new buzzword too. Uh, Faith, there's another one for you. Gamified. Everything is yes. is uh, turning into a little bit more of a fun experience, I guess. And in the meantime, HR learns a lot about you. So very interesting. Um, Faith, now what are you seeing with new trends taking place in the financial industry? Uh, is there, you know, what what's what's taking shape? Yeah, so Judy, I think you brought up, again, another buzzword, love my buzzwords, automation. So this comes up a lot of conversation at events, advisements, one-on-ones, just speaking to groups of students to get challenged on it too. Why would I go into accounting? It's all getting automated. But uh, to touch on your point, Judy, about talking about the automating the hiring process, and I think, David, you kind of mentioned this as well, is reading that job posting very carefully. There's Again, this is why I talk about buzzwords, just going to be specific uh kind of themes that you see in these job postings so if you go through try to pick out words that are used several times or okay i'm seeing a real theme of teamwork they really want a candidate that really knows how like good good teamwork skill good communication skills okay that's how i'm going to tailor my resume and cover letter it is so incredibly important to ta tailor every single application you do and i know it's it's so frustrating and time consuming but it is worth it it will get you that many more callbacks for it as well and automation doesn't necessarily have to be scary because then you need to think to yourself too okay what can't be automated and i think this is the biggest thing too this is something that like i have to answer a lot and that's the things i thought about myself as well it's like what can't be automated decision making there's um i always like talking about this story i'm a huge sci-fi nerd so isaac asimov has a really good story i robot it's a pretty good pretty good will smith movie too but they talk about the human element of making a decision. So it's not too spoiler, it's in the first like five minutes, but like he's in a car crash and he has a higher chance of survival. So he's saved by this robot instead of this little girl. If it was a human in that capacity, they would probably save the child first. But because there's this calculation, there's this AI element of calculating it. But the human decision element, like Judy, in your role, I would think ultimately the decision of yes or no, should we give an offer letter to this person still comes down to you. A computer is not making that decision. So thinking um, to uh, kind of like, okay, what are the skills that I can really start to develop? So I think the emerging trends of uh, technology as well is really looking, taking a hard look at those soft skills. So I think that's where the gamify component comes in as well. Cause they're really trying to dig in, you know, trying not to ask those like, like very, um, I don't know if anyone has ever done those like Harry Potter house quizzes where it's like, okay, it's very obvious the answer you're gonna get based on how you answer the questions, but the gamifying really trying to get you outside of your head 
and dig in, okay, what is this person's work ethic? What is their approach to uh, competing demands for attention? Really trying to get to know the person. That's what the interview is. To get your foot in the door, you need to tailor your application, have those words in it. So when it is scanned by those automated processes, it does pop out and it's like, okay, this person looks interesting, you should review it. And then you look through that, uh, their, their application as well. Okay, let's bring them in for an interview. And most times in my experience, if you're being brought in for the interview, based on your technical application, you can do the job. They're just seeing who's the best candidate for the fit. Because team culture is a huge, and Judy, I can see you nodding. So I, because I'm not an actual recruiter for a company, like do like involved, heavily involved in the hiring process, I always feel like that's a little bit of a risky thing to say, but seeing you nodding about that too, really it's kind of almost have your mentality, not to give yourself a big head about it, but kind of your job to lose when you walk into the interview room. It's like they see potential. Not everyone, you know, a million applications at TD, only a couple of people are brought in for an interview because they see something in you and you're trying to see if it's a good culture fit. That's really what the interview is. But as far as like emerging trends, things to look out for, coding is a huge thing that I've seen really uh, come up in a lot of stuff. Not to say that everybody needs to be a programmer, but just to have a basic knowledge to be able to like hold a conversation about it, being able to explain different concepts to people. Communication is such a huge huge deal and such a huge strength to have on your uh, resume is just having a basic knowledge just taking some like little boot camp courses udemy is actually a really good website i do a lot of courses there just to have some working knowledge like my strengths are in the human skill realm and talent development i will never be a programmer i will not be a cpa that's just not where my interests or inclination lie so but i still want to be able to speak to uh, my partner who is a programmer so I still want to be able to hold a conversation with him. So like I'll, I would look over a lot of his school notes too, just so you have like a working knowledge. Power BI, so Excel, Excel is classic. You can never go wrong with having a strong Excel skill. Power BI is a huge data analytic um, visualizer. Really great to have that under your belt. There's lots of different boot camps and resources out there. Really tap into uh, like the alumni network, your your your, your uh, post secondary institution. There's lots of resources out there for you. Um, Power BI is a huge thing. Data analytics. You see anything that has data analytics on it, check it out because I think that's the biggest thing emerging out of this too, and that kind of ties back into the whole decision making. That ultimately you're still going to be the decision maker, but these programs they'll break at some point, so you do need to know how to like fix them or how they work. Yeah, for myself, like I don't need to have deep intimate knowledge about how this report in Power BI is built, but I do need to know how to manipulate it to get the data, to get the results that I need to look into to figure out how to make better events for students more engaging. Okay, a lot of, you know, surprising, the data is showing me that actually a lot of students came out to this event, a lot of first time people came out to this. So this is a huge draw for people. We should do more stuff like this. So having that sort of background. Okay, and so just repeat that. So coding, Power BI, Excel, and data analytics are some key yeah. ones for the financial industry that would be really great to have yes. as additional skills, right? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, great. Thanks, Faith. Um, David, what about you? With your activities um, at TD, do you do you use those sort of skills? Um, what kind of activities are you involved in, and what kind of challenges do you face on a daily basis? Yeah, so, so yeah, now with um with banking, especially like since COVID, you do have a lot of um analytic departments now. So knowing how to code is major. Um, just having that tech background is major. There is a lot of job opportunities within the banking organization, not just TD, just a whole bunch of banking institutions across the board. There's a lot of analytical um opportunities for those that in that tech space. Um, for me, being a team lead, um. I am looking over a group of 15 people. So we do work on different projects. We do um, have a lot of touch point meetings just to assure, just to get updates on like how projects are going, what's needed, um, having a lot of touch point meetings with the team and just other stakeholders and branch partners also. So it is, it is really cool. It is really good to know things like that in regards to the tech space. And that's the beauty of the bank too. There's just a wide range of departments that you could work within. Do you have a sense of where you want to take your career path? Um, so right now, uh, I'm still, I'm still, wor I'm still working on that. 
um, for me, um, during my time with TD, it, it's kind of it's kind of funny because as I networked and with the people that I met, they kind of recommended me to certain um, opportunities. So even me being a team lead right now, that wasn't really my route. I wanted to be a financial advisor and probably become a private investor after. And someone on my previous team provide um, presented this opportunity to me and said, "Hey, David, I think this would be a great fit for you." And just give it a shot. So kind of like what um, Judy said earlier in college, we kind of we all have our dream jobs, right? And coming straight out of school, you're not necessarily going to get your dream job. Some people do and some people don't. But the beauty in the workforce is that you could work your way up to your dream job. So sometimes you might not have all the skills needed to get to that dream job right away. So it's good to kind of like navigate and work through different departments and gain those skills and kind of set up um, goals for yourself. So you could say in the next three to five years, I'm gonna achieve my dream job and this is what I'm gonna do in order to achieve that dream job. So just working in different departments, learning different skills and just taking those skills and just moving up, climbing the ladder. Nice, okay, sounds like lots of opportunity. That is great. And uh, I wanted to ask Judy, can you tell us a bit more about, you know, KPMG and share your advice for grads trying to enter the financial field. I know you've touched on it a bit, but, you know, great to get advice on, you know, to get into a place like KPMG. What is the advice you have? Yeah. So as many of you may already know that we are a global network of professional services. So we have audit, tax and advisory. So it, we have a lot of opportunities here, both locally and abroad, and we're growing more than ever and tying in all the data analytic digital part. We're also building digital capabilities in our all service line, so audit, tax advisory. So, for example, to give you an example, we have something called KPMG Clara, and that's something um, it's a smart audit platform, and it's designed to enhance our audit quality and provide deeper insights to our clients. So, I think data analytics, digital digitization is everywhere, and it's adapting to a lot of different roles. And I think my advice, I kind of touched on it before, and not to be repetitive, but networking is super important and just to add coming out to events like if you have a particular company that you're interested in for example if you're if you want to work at kpmg we have a lot of events happening and um around the year um, so we have like info sessions and every um event that we host we always have a networking portion at the end and that's where you really get to meet our industry rep so it's always good to talk to recruiters but i think it's um also very important to talk to um, the ones that actually work in those roles, because they're the ones that I can they can tell you what they do day to day, like what kind of skills, uh, how they got there, and career progressions. And I think those details recruiters can tell you, but it, it's better to hear from themselves. So I think um, if you see an event, if you see a company hosting something that you're interested in, like I hundred percent. Um, try to go if you can, if you have the time and take advantage of the networking opportunities. And I think that will make your career, uh, career search journey, a journey more uh, successful. And like what we said before, like you never know who you're going to, you know, meet at the end or who you're going to run into during an interview or networking. So like I know, um, for example, this, um, one of the students that came to a networking session met this one um, representative from KPMG, but that person turned out to be interviewer for the role that she applied to. So I think, wow. there, you know, it's like a small world, like everyone yeah. said, like, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. So I think also keep in mind, uh, open mind for opportunities and just network and feel for free yeah. to connect with you know people that you're interested in you know if you see a job uh, role um, that are posted and you see a recruiter under it like message that person you know it doesn't hurt to do and we always try our best to reply to all of the students it's, it, it can get hard but we get to most of it and yeah like i would say um, just, um keep applying and i think if you don't lose hope. I know a lot of people can lose hope after a while when they, you know, apply for jobs, but they're not getting any calls back or um, any, any anything back. But I think that's where you need to push more and then, you know, go to, you know, workshops to tailor your application. How can you make your application better? Like push yourself and, and, and then you'll get your dream job or 
a step away to your dream job. So I think yeah, uh, that's my advice for new grads. And I agree. I think if you're not getting a lot of callbacks, have someone look over your resume again. Take a look at your LinkedIn. Are you presenting yourself well? Um, I'm looking at the time. We're, we're, we're kind of short on time. I did want to get um, David to share with us one piece of advice you have uh, that we sh for grads who are looking to start their careers, whether it's in the financial industry or elsewhere. Um, like a lot of us touched on it, Judy and Faith touched on it. The biggest piece of advice I would say is just network. I remember coming, starting in George Brown College. Um, I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And I remember my small business professor, Robert Good, first day of class, he said, rule number one is network and make it your goal to get 100 contacts each semester because you just never know who's going to be who's who what someone what the person beside you what they're going to become so just network get 100 contacts because that person in your class might help you find your next job or that person in your class you might start a business with them you just never know so don't be afraid to speak to your neighbor, speak to those in your course, because you guys all have the same goal. Whichever course you're taking, you all have the same goal to get a job in that profession. And even if it's not in that profession, you, you just have that goal to have a career, right? So just always network. And I know now with um, the pandemic, school is a bit different. There's a lot of online going on, so we're not really on campus right now. So just try to set up coffee chats with people in your different classes, pick their brains, um, have conversation on what their aspirations are, what they're looking for out of this course, because they could help you. Just because you're not in school doesn't mean you can't, just because you're not fully on campus right now, it doesn't mean you can't network. It doesn't mean you can't get acquainted with your peers. Just, and don't be shy. Um, even if you don't have, even if you, have, if you don't have that courage, you have, that bit of fear in you, just break out of your shell. That's what school and that's what college is about. It preps you for the real world. It preps you for your career and the real world, basically. So you, you want to break out of your shell. You want to kind of step out of bounds a bit and just build yourself as a person and build your confidence. Fantastic. That is great advice. Now I'm looking at the time. We only have a few minutes for for questions. And so we want to jump into those before we wrap up. Um, so and everything has been great. The information has been fantastic. Really, really amazing. Um, okay, let me see if there's any questions from different places where I get them. Um, here, well, here's one that came through from our support. Um, okay, so basically, how do you transition from the retail industry to the banking or financial industry? And it's an interesting question because I know a lot of grads have a lot of retail experience just because it's the nature of when you're at work or at school, you tend to pick that up. Um, is it easy to transition? Uh, and what are those skills maybe that you've developed that are, are can transition into the financial sector? Um, Anyone to want to take that? Yeah. To touch a bit about that, so the funny thing about banking that a lot of people don't know, so working in branch for bank for banking is actually considered a retail position. So being a teller or financial advisor, just working in that branch is considered a retail position. So just get your foot in the door, getting your foot in the door, get yourself a position, and kind of find out where you want, what your next move is, where you want to. Um, what the next step of your career is going to be. Because the cool thing about the bank is they have a lot of internal portals that um, let you know about job opportunities, what's next, and what to do in order to obtain those jobs. And once you're in the bank force, it's easy for your manager to reach out to the hiring manager to set up a conversation with you and the hiring manager to see if this is the position that you want. And the cool thing too is even before the interview, you might even get an opportunity to shadow that position to see if that's where you really want to take your career, if that's the next move that you want to take. So that's 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 a cool little tip to let you guys know that working in the branch actually is actually considered retail inside the branch. And a lot of people in a lot of students in college don't know is you could get yourself a part-time position as a teller in in branch and still do your studies. And once you graduate, become a full-time and take that next step within. Mm -hmm. All right. That's good to know. Actually, really good to know um, that there are lots of transitional uh, skills, transferable skills. Uh, okay. Another question that came in a little bit earlier, and I want to ask it is, um, you know, what are some career pathways and the right way to approach it is the question. So, um, 
uh, and I guess there are lots of career pathways, but who would like to address that question? I can address like a little bit of that. Okay. So we talked a lot about dream jobs uh, today too. So when you're thinking about your dream job, I, I would challenge you to really not necessarily think of a title, but rather what do you want to do in your day to day? So I think the, the career path, plotting out a very specific route kind of like gives you a little bit of tunnel vision. So I speak to a lot of students that have like very specific tunnel vision on like a handful of companies and they're like, if I, my career is over if I do not get into these companies. But I think it's what I challenge them to think about that because sometimes I get a lot of, especially around this time of year, panic students uh, asking for advisements around this. It's like, what, what do I do? And I'm like, you can do anything because think of, so you, you mentioned it, Trisha, about transferable skills. All of you have developed a lot of transferable skills that can really translate to any industry. You can take a look at my LinkedIn about the different, like I worked at a library, I taught English, I worked at CPA. I've been using the same skill set through everything. So I, I hope that that kind of, I'm so sorry, my cat is meowing. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's that's our world time. we live in right now. So don't I know I'm so sorry about that. But yeah, I think it's to challenge yourself to think about your dream job as just like a kind of activities that you, you yeah. really want to do. You you folks have so many different career paths. This is something I struggled with too, being you know graduating as an arts major with like a history degree. There's no clear path for that. I think it's just really keeping yourself open to opportunities and you know a bit of a broken record about networking too. But I think networking exposes you to so many different opportunities and pathways that you never would have considered like just th through my career when I've transitioned to several different departments within CPA I just talked to them and I remember speaking to uh, my colleague Sean and when I was applying for the job I was like I just want to know a little bit more before I apply and it, that's incredibly valuable what you can do with professionals over those informational interviews they're so important so it, find that dream job or if you do have that very specific title that you want to get Find that person on LinkedIn and ask them, okay, what's it like in your job? What do you actually like? What do you actually do? What's it like? Yeah, like, you know, myth busting a little bit. Try on the, the the job, so to speak. Judy, did you want to add anything on to that? Yeah, actually, yeah, I did. Um, so yes, um, following on, on what Faith said, I think if you're, you know, in the beginning, you you are not sure what you want to do. Uh, if you don't have a vision or anything like that, I would say start with your courses. Like, what did you like? What, what, did, what was your favorite course? What did you like the most? And a lot of times you can kind of, you know, use Google and kind of search those topics and kind of fit kind of career uh, options. It has, has a lot of resources on that. I think that will be your first step if you're really unsure of what to do. For example, if you really like accounting course, then from an audit firm, but if you like the accounting um, accounting course, then you know your next step will be you know accountant. Um, but like as I like I said, I think coming out to these events like this, like our um, your company, like your you know future companies events that uh, are a lot of recruiters host, that that's where you can kind of meet those industry reps. Um, you can of course uh, reach out on LinkedIn, have those coffee chats. But I think. Um, coming out to these events are actually more natural way to meet people because you're, you know, already in the same event. Um, so you just have to talk to that person. So I think like just being open minded, like do a lot of research and like what um what you both said, like reach out to that person that has a job title because that person will, you know, most likely have the same problem when they were graduate and they're like, what do I want to do? But they got to where they want it. So that's um that's a little bit to add on to what they said, yeah. Well, you know, we're just at time. So if, if you're, if you didn't get your answer, your question answered, or you want more information, uh, please feel free to reach out to our panelists. I think that they've said they're, they're good for, uh, if you want to link up on LinkedIn and ask your questions, a great way to get your networking going. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Of course, especially Faith. Judy and David, appreciate all your information, your observations, your insights about the financial industry. Really, really great information. My pleasure. Thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah, and we do mean it. Like, please, please reach out to me on LinkedIn for any questions. Like, we're, mm -hmm. we're here to help and like answer those questions. And if you have questions about networking too, I love, do love busting those myths as well. And thank you so much to George Brown and to you, Trisha, for, for such a great panel. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank Thanks so much. Take care, us. everyone. Stay well. Bye for now.